in the fifth chapter, making our way toward the end. So we'll be in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in verse 12 today. Um, as you're flipping there, I wanted to mention a couple of things. Um, number one, uh, I wanted again just to recommend and encourage you, uh, if you have not used one of the conversation guides, we have those available in the lobby uh, at, the, at the information booth. It's just a way of, uh, number one, it just lays out what the sermon's about and everything like that, kind of does some of your notes for you, but it also gives you a spot to take notes. Um, some people are better at taking notes than others. I can't concentrate when I'm making a whole lot of notes. I get that, but it's just a way to encourage you to walk through the text with us. But um, what I would strongly encourage, whether you use those conversation guides or not, please be reading with us through. Um, and especially now, as we are nearing the end of the fifth chapter, you might have forgotten what came in the first two chapters, right? Just give it a glance during the week, reread through the book that we're uh, working through. It's an immense help. Um, I also wanted to mention, uh, Rick had mentioned that we're having baby dedications on May 14th, which is Mother's Day, I've been told. So uh, if, you're, if, you're a, yeah, if you have a mother, you're welcome for me reminding you ahead of time. But we'll be having baby dedications. I know we have a church, and, and we love the idiosyncrasies here at Grace, every little nuance of how we do things. But you're a list of verse church, right? We do not like lists here at Grace. We don't like signing them. We know they're in the lobby and we go our separate ways. Let me encourage you, please either sign the list or if you don't want to sign, that was a joke by the way. Everybody looks genuinely offended. If you don't want to sign the list, just let us know. We want to make sure to prepare and we also want to walk through that with the families because one of the questions that we always have is why do a baby dedication? Um, what's the point of it? Are we just showing off whose baby is the cutest? Um, which in and of itself would be a worthwhile activity, I think. But uh, but no, I wanted, I wanted just briefly, as we're walking into this, um, to point out like some of the most well-known, or one of the most well-known Hebrew phrases in the Old Testament we find in the Shema. And I'll have it on the board here in a minute, but just listen to the words when it says, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And this is what it's saying in Deuteronomy 4, or 6, 4 through 9 rather. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And this is what I want to point out about this. There is a biblical impetus that we commit, as you did this morning as we're celebrating baptism, we're committing to raising the next generation in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And it's not just, oh, that would have been a great spot for an amen. I'll, I'll say it again slower. No, this is something, <laughs> we have to be about this, church, honestly. You, you, we all understand the world catechizes us daily. And the world is catechizing you with something that is anti-gospel and anti-God. That doesn't mean we just hate the entire world and go, our, you know, go form a cloister, but it does mean we have to intentionally instruct the next generation, and indeed we're commanded to do so. And that's not just for the parents. So don't look around and say, well, I don't have young ones here. It's on the church as a whole that we commit to doing these things. I think it is a good and a healthy thing for us to do that formally as a church. When we talk about salvation especially, we're, we're celebrating Christian baptism this morning. Salvation is a gift from God alone. Right? We, we, and we call it by many different biblical uh, names, regeneration, new life, the drawing. God makes us come to life. Um, so salvation is a gift of God, but we want to covenant with our families. We want our families to covenant with us, not as if we can impart salvation on our young ones, but to commit to raising them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, something that, number one, God commands, and number two, God blesses. That's something we need to take hold of as a church and say, yes, we do care for the next generation with all their noises and with all their needs. We're going to commit to raising them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord with that expectation, not just a longing and not just a vain hope, but an expectation that they will one day, as we saw today, profess Christ with their mouth and believe in their heart that Jesus is Lord and we celebrate that God has saved them to himself. Um, if you have any questions about baby dedication, please come and talk to me afterward. We'd, uh, we'd always love to talk more with you about that. But I, I would just encourage you, when we talk about baptism, when we talk about the promises of God, um, has anyone had a dreary week? Has anyone, it's so sad that we always get so many head nods for this, right? Has anyone heard tragic medical news from a family member this week? Many of us have. 
Has anybody had a misfortune happen in their life this week that was outside your immediate control? Probably. Today we're celebrating that there's a God who raises the dead to life. You serve a God who brings life from death. There is so much encouragement here for us as Christians. I'm going to preach a different sermon if I'm not careful. Let's jump in. Okay. Go ahead and stand with me if you can and are able. We stand just to honor the reading of God's word. We'll be looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I'm going to read verse 12 ambitiously down through verse 18 this morning. Um, at the, uh, after I read this passage, you're going to hear me affirm that this is the word of the Lord. I encourage you to just respond at that point with, thanks be to God. Hear now the word of the living God. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Uh, brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning as we continue our worship. Father God, Lord, we are indeed grateful, Lord, that you're a God that brings the dead to life. Lord, this is not just a, a novelty that we celebrate on Easter, Lord. You are a God who is continually bringing life out of the death of this world, Lord. You're a God that gives us encouragement, true, lasting encouragement in the trials and the tribulations that we face in our life, God. You're a God that in the midst of the darkest places gives the brightest light and the truest hope. God, let us cling tightly to your ankles, Lord. Let us follow closely by your guiding hand. God, let us grow and abound in a love for you that spills out into this fellowship for one another. God, we need you. and We're confident that what you command, Lord, you supply. So we ask that you do so, and we, we ask this humbly in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. I almost skipped ahead of myself there. I, I, I had ambitiously planned down further, down through verse 22. I trimmed it back to verse 18. As always, I expect grace when I don't make it to where we're supposed to end today. We'll, we'll see how far we get. Uh, the first thing I want to look at is respecting your leaders. And I want to look at verses 12 and 13. And I'm going to reread them uh, just to refresh us. Verse 12 and 13, as we think toward respecting our leaders, Paul says, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we'll, we'll pause right there for a minute. So it begins with Paul asking this Thessalonian church, he's been speaking with them now for five chapters and running, right? And he's admonishing them here to respond to what he said previously. And that's why I say like, it's so helpful to at least review, skim over these, uh, these books, the whole book of 1 Thessalonians, so only you know, these five short chapters. But just before we get in here, to just remember where we've come. Based on what's come before, he's now saying uh, to respond to what he's said. And he uses the word ask here. If you have the KJV, it says beseech, which I quite prefer the KJV in this, in this context. But he's beseeching, asking them, please respond then. And he frames it quite warmly. He frames it by addressing them as brothers. And again, usually when you see the word brothers, you can assume brothers and sisters. He's speaking to us as family, first to the Thessalonians, but also to those who are in Christ. And that should be encouraging to us as we hear Paul's words here. He's not speaking as someone removed, someone who's distant from this, from this flock. He's speaking to them as fellow children of God, fellow, fellow heirs in the kingdom of God. And, and based on that common denominator, their identity in Christ, if you remember where we walked through last week with our identity. Based on that identity, Paul asked them, respond now with, with godly fruit. Let that identity then drive this godly fruit that's going to come out of you. And Paul speaks here about those who serve in the church as leaders, and he describes them with three little descriptors. He said, they labor among you. He said, they are over you in the Lord. And he says, they admonish you. All those little descriptors that pop up here. The church in Thessalonica, and, and obviously this applies to us today as well, but the church in Thessalonica, they needed to know how to interact with their, with their leaders. 
And we're going to walk through what those leaders look like. Scripture points out two different roles of leader, specifically within the church, that of elder and that of deacon. And we'll walk a little bit more through that. But I'm going to admit at the front end a slight, ever so slight bit of discomfort as one of your elders preaching a passage that tells you how to respond then to your elders, right? You can see it's a conflict of interest that I'm, that I'm doing here. But as with any of these passages, we're going to remove me from the situation and we're going to wholeheartedly lean on what God says in his word, right? If God gives us this, this is beneficial for us and this is a command for us. So we're just going to lean into it without undue apologies. But just know that at the front end, I understand the irony that I'm here preaching to you about how to respond to your elders. But you can find qualifications if you're thinking about who's qualified biblically to be an elder um, and even to be a deacon. We can look in 1 Timothy 3. We can look in Titus 1. But I want to say this at the front end, and I encourage you to look through our church documents how we spell this out. Elders and deacons are two different, but they're complementary roles of leadership and service within the church. Different roles, elders are not deacons, deacons are not elders, and yet they complement one another within the church. And as we're thinking toward that, and we're going to speak about this in the coming weeks too, when we install leaders here at the church, you might use the word ordain or appoint or something like that, but when we're installing these leaders here at the church, it's less so that we're looking around to think who we would like to fill that role. What we're relying on is that if God gives his church leaders that we are looking to identify those that God is raising up, those that God is equipping in the church. Because again, if God is demanding this of his church, There's going to be elders, there's going to be deacons, serve well under them, et cetera, et cetera. We can expect then that God will supply what is needed for his church. We're not having to go, you know, know, rattle the bushes and trying to scare up some leaders somewhere. No, no, no. We, We look around confidently knowing God has commanded this. He will supply this. All of what I just said, though, this is not a departure from what Paul has been working through previously. So if you're thinking back to the previous chapters, this might seem a little bit odd. Like Paul's been talking about this great eschatological hope we have. He's speaking of the final day. He's speaking of the coming of the Lord, all these grand things. And then all of a sudden he's like, oh, by the way, get along. You know, don't bicker in the church. Respect your leaders. It, it, it seems like he's almost kind of like gone off script, doesn't it? Just a little bit. Let me, let me encourage you. He's not departing from where he's built. What he's trying to say is live in light of the end. Live in light of that end that we've been talking about. We've been walking through true hope in what the God of all of history has written as his grand story. And with that end in sight, now, believer, this is how you live. This is deeply tied to where we've been in the previous passages. And I dare say that it would do the church so much service if we don't divorce how we live from what we believe about what God's doing in this world. Our eschatological convictions, in other words, the convictions we have about how God is consummating all things to himself, that directly drives how then shall we live, to borrow from Francis Schaeffer here. But we should recognize many in the church, certainly many outside the church, but many even within the church, we struggle with authority. Okay? Can we all just, and I'm not divorcing myself from this, from this scenario, we all struggle with authority. Inevitably, when I do marital counseling, and I'm saying this with nobody in this room having been through this scenario, so don't think I'm, I'm, I'm doing that pastor thing, um, but when you walk through marital counseling, and inevitably you hit the passage where it says, wives submit to your husbands, and that's where inevitably the fireworks go off. And it's not for no reason. Now, we can define exactly what Scripture's working through there and, and, and all those dynamics, but at the end of the day, can we just admit we don't necessarily like authority, Nobody's nodding their heads. Y'all, I, I, I'm, quite, I'm quite clear I'm not alone on this. Um, we don't like authority very much. And, and maybe even as Americans, um, or at least for, for many of us, we kind of have that pull yourself up by your own bootstraps mentality, right? You make your own way in this world. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when that bleeds over into our biblical thinking, it can cause some problems. When we want to reject any authority that's over us, it can cause some problems within the church but it oftentimes bleeds into the way we treat the church. And you, and you can see, that, you can see that the outworking of this. Many modern Western churches, have I defined enough descriptors on there yet? Most of the churches that we will run into here in the West and specifically in America are delivering a product. You, you probably won't hear much about authority, and you certainly won't hear much about the demand that its members serve, the command, rather, from God that its members serve within the church, and that we have these working relationships. You won't hear that. What you'll hear is you'll hear entertaining music, and you'll hear very short preaching. Uh, you'll have a lot of activities and a lot of events. You may have good coffee, but if you neglect those underlying things of what builds the church, you're going to be lacking the foundation. Because once again, God knows how to write a really good story. 
And he just built you with a lot of eschatological hope through these chapters. And how does he start to conclude this message? Here's how you live with one another. It's important that we pay attention to how this is spelled out. Many, many Christians, though, we bristle when we hear things like submitting to our elders or our pastors. Many Christians bristle even at the idea of having a covenant fellowship with one another. Like, I'm tied to that guy in the next aisle. That doesn't sound very good, but we bristle at these things within the church, especially when we, th- we talk about things like exercising church discipline. Even when I say that phrase, you may think, oh, that's about excommunicating people from the church. No, it's, and there's so much more that's involved in church discipline. Oftentimes, it's just a brother going to a brother, right? But this isn't practiced within a lot of churches. We've neglected these things at, to our detriment. Hence, we have a culture, and I'm trying not to be too negative, but I want to paint the picture of why this is really important for us in the American church. We have a church, uh, culture of church shopping, transient church membership, and an attitude on, on the part of many Christians that effectively rejects any biblical semblance of authority within the church. That's just not good. Um, if that's where we find ourselves, we just need to say that's not good. We want to pursue then what God is clear, uh, laying out because Scripture is really clear about authority. And let me walk you into that a little bit. First, we can recognize Christ holds all authority. That'd be a really good spot for an amen. Christ holds all authority, and not just a heavenly authority. He says all authority in heaven and on earth, all of it, right? So he is the source, the fount, the descriptor of all authorities. But we're also told then that he delegates some of that authority. He delegates some of that authority at his church. Some of that authority is delegated through those that are qualified and called then to serve in the church, like elders, like deacons. He uh, delegates his authority through families, Parents have a unique particular authority within their family. It's a unique sphere of authority that they have. He he even designates that through civil magistrates, even though sometimes we really struggle to understand how that is. But he's delegated authority to the civil magistrate. So hence, with all that in mind, Paul here speaks of those who are over you. Not as in those who are over you as in they are better than you, which is what makes us bristle, I think, a bit. We think, oh, well, who's that guy? It's not about that. It's about those who God has delegated his authority to. It's not their authority, but it's God's authority that he then delegates through. You guys get in that picture of God delegating authority? That's a really important part of this whole conversation. And, and just to kind of frame your thinking, I want you to remember how the letter started. When we, when we started this letter back in chapter 1, Paul writes to the Thessalonians. Remember, this is a smiling letter, which is good for Paul, right? Paul, Paul knows how to write a frowning letter. This is a smiling letter. And he writes to them, he says, I'm encouraged by you. Why, chapter 1? You turned from serving idols to serving the living God. Remember that back in chapter 1? Um, he says, you served them, but now you serve God. And the takeaway we can take from that, and it's throughout Scripture, is you will serve someone. We can have problems with authority all day. We can have problems with, with the call to serve God all day. But at the end of the day, the Scripture says you either serve the King of Kings who has your best in his interests or best in his will, or... You can serve idols and ultimately serve your own destruction. So that's where, th- that's where the Thessalonian church has been brought from, serving idols to serving God. We serve God, and yet we recognize the authorities that God's placed over, that, over us. Paul gets into that in chapter 2. So chapter 1, he says, I praise God, you were serving idols, now you're serving the living God. And then chapter 2, he starts to talk about fathers with children and describes them as the leaders in the church. We serve you and we instruct you as a father would to his child. That's delegated authority. Authority that Christ holds, then that he has delegated to them. Why is this so important? It's not important because I, I, as one of your elders, want to go on a power trip. Please hear me on this one. It's a problem because if we have problems with biblical authority, we will have problems with the God who delegates the authority. Please hear me on this one. If we want to look at why so, there's, there's some deep-seated m- malignant problems within the American church, it's because when we reject authority that God delineates, we wind up rejecting the God that has all authority and delineates that authority. This is, this is a heart issue in a huge way for the Christian church. So getting back to what we do here at Grace. We here at Grace are led by elders. Elders are tasked with the spiritual oversight of the church, and I use that as a biblical term. That's not a made-up one. Oversight of the church. And we are also led by deacons who serve the needs of the congregation. And here at Grace, we have no problems between our elders and deacons, and for that I praise God. I've heard of churches that have strife thereof. That seems a sin problem. I'm thankful that God has blessed us with such rich leadership uh, here at Grace. But as in Thessalonica, our leaders are called to, and I'm looking back to the text now, 
labor among you. Labor among you. That's a really important, important little phrase because when I hear the words labor among you, two things pop out. The first thing that pops out to me is there's hard work involved in serving in the church of God. That's, that's that word labor. Labor is not just I'm going to go you know, nail a nail. Labor is sweat. My back aches after I'm done, right? Hard labor. And I want you to think of Paul's example. How was Paul treated as a laborer in Christ? Well, Paul was often mistreated by governing authorities, um, but he was also persecuted by false religious leaders. He was lied about by the people he served. He was rebelled against by the churches that he sacrificed to go to. Paul knew what it was like to labor, and oftentimes labor in a thankless manner. And yet, what does Paul say about all that labor? Does he say, I wash my hands of you sinners? I'm... Listen to Paul's words in one of the most misquoted passages in all Scripture, Philippians chapter 4. He said, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Here's the secret. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It's not about winning your football game. Paul's talking here about, I know what it is like to sing from the jail cell and to count it all to Christ's account. Even when the churches that I planted rebel against me and ultimately against Christ, I count it all to Christ's account. Why? He's content in Christ. Paul found the secret of contentment. So there's the hard work aspect, but I also hear the personal aspect. He says those who labor, not just out there in the sky somewhere, they're the ones that labor among you. If I wrote in my Bible, I'd have that one circled or underlined, but I don't write in my Bible. But if you write in your Bible, that's a good one to, to circle, among you. And this is what I want to point out from this. Please beware of internet pastors. Please, brothers and sisters, beware of internet pastors. I have watched many good leaders, and I have recommended many good leaders in the Christian faith to you. I've watched many videos and listened to many podcasts, but there's always something that's in the back of my mind. They're not among me. They're not among us. There's always a distance. There's always a little, bit of, a little bit of vagueness there. I don't know them, neither do they know me. And I point that out because it has become extremely popular in American Christianity to get our church, quote-unquote, from the television screen. That's not laborers who labor among you. And there's no divorcing the biblical content of one who serves in your midst, whose house you know, whose life you can observe, who prays for you weekly. There is, and I'm not just putting myself here. I'm thinking of all our elders and I'm thinking of our deacons. There's no substitute for the leaders God has placed in your midst. So go home and listen to R.C. Sproul and count it a joy that God blessed his church with somebody like that. But never think that's the one who's called the labor among you. There's an immense blessing to the local body that God has called us to. Also, he says, our leaders are over you in the Lord. And that's a tough phrase, isn't it? Over you in the Lord. I already pointed out to some, you may hear that over you in the Lord, and they may think, well, what, are they better Christians? Are they, are they holier than thou Christians? Like, what does that look like? What it's pointing out here is that those who serve in the body as leaders, they are called to a weighty task of spiritual oversight. And it is a weighty task. There's warnings in Scripture again uh, about those who serve. Scripture says not to rush behind a pulpit nor behind a Bible to teach because it's going to incur a harsher judgment. Like that's a big deal to serve within the Christian church. And yet, we recognize why are they over us? They're over us because they've been tasked or delegated authority by Christ. And Christ holds all authority, certainly in heaven and on earth, but also within His church. So I point that out because it's a heavy responsibility, and it's one of the reasons why here at Grace we are quite attached and quite biblically fond of the plural elder model. Quite fond of that. It's the reason that we came from Mississippi. Our elders here are equal co-laborers in the gospel, and we share not only the blessings of that leadership, but the responsibilities and the labor of that leadership. That's why I'm here, is to labor alongside and with other elders. Hence here, Paul, we can kind of I don't want to stretch this too far, but when he refers to the leaders, it's plural. It's those, plural, who labor among you. I point that out because oftentimes we have imbibed so much of our, uh, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really swinging the bat at America today, I understand that, but we have imbibed a lot of the cultural expectations of our economy into the church house, and this is what I mean. We have CEO models where there is one, one personality-driven figure who pretty much by himself autocratically directs the, the spiritual condition of the church. 
I'm just, I'm just putting this out here. I don't see that in Scripture, and I can think of a lot of biblical reasons why that is a huge risk and danger to the local church. It is good to have men that share together this role of spiritual oversight within the church. We're also told that our leaders admonish you. Admonish you, which is, which is a good word. Um, leaders here at Grace and in all of God's churches, we're commanded to instruct, we're called, we're called to train, and we're called to help mold you as you grow in Christ-likeness, which it sometimes is easier than other times, right? Sometimes that means a good smiling letter like Paul is writing to the Thessalonica. Sometimes it's a little bit harder of a letter. Hey, I see something. We need to talk. There's a concern there, right? There's varying levels of that, but never can we shy away from this biblical call of admonishing those that we labor among. Many times that comes through simple things like this right here. This is admonishment, the preaching of God's word regularly. This is why we, we honor the preaching of God's word. It's not for the man behind the pulpit. It's for the fact that if God delegates this authority, he is blessing this as an admonishment to our body. This is good admonishment of the Christian church. So sometimes it's like that. Sometimes it's teaching. Sometimes it's com, uh, conversations with one another throughout the week. Other times it escalates. Sometimes there's hard conversations. Sometimes there's pointed correction that comes against us. On, on rare occasions, there's a focused rebuke that is involved here with admonishment. I see sin in your life. I must rebuke this sin for your good and for the good of this body. That's part of the admonishment process. But I want to point this out. In all those things, what is the end goal we are looking for in admonishing the church? It's certainly not to make my week easier, nor any of our leaders, right? Why do we admonish? Why do we admonish? For growth, for spiritual growth, and ultimately for encouragement within the body. We do this for the same reason as if I have a medical problem, I address it. Why? Because once it, once it grows, it will wind up affecting the whole body. It is best for all involved for us to address these issues in love for the purposes of reconciliation and redemption. Everybody following me here? When we talk about something like church discipline, that's not a, ooh, they're that kind of church. No, church discipline is a blessing God gave so you can call me to account if you see sin in my life that will destroy me. It's a blessing to the church, and it's an unfortunate turn that it's become something that we kind of turn our nose up at, um, as if it's some sort of judgmental activity. The trouble, though, in our day, and again, I know I'm swinging my bat quite wildly today, but um, I, I feel this is warranted. The trouble in our day is that there's so many that will occupy a Christian pulpit and break God's word open, and yet will never, with any of their leadership, will never commit to admonishing the body of Christ. There's a lot of that in our culture. Men who preach, men who preach far better than I can, and yet men who never hold the body one to another to account for the sin and for the error and for the spiritual, just normal spiritual growth that we're looking for in the body of Christ. Nothing's ever specific from those pulpits. Sin is never confronted from those pulpits, and ultimately spiritual growth is stagnant in those bodies. It's not good for you, and it's not good for me when we don't admonish one another. I, I would point this out. You're familiar with this passage, but in 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, he said, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to truth and wander off into myths. I point that out just to say this. That's not biblical leadership. Muscles don't grow from lack of exercise. I cannot sit on a couch and eat potato chips and grow muscles. Um, so when we are wanting to grow strong, and we are all wanting to grow strong in the Lord. Um, it's going to require some, some growth. It's going to require some pain. It's going to require some work on our part. And that's why Paul points this out as labor. Now, don't miss this part. Paul calls you as the congregation to do two things concerning your spiritual leaders right here in the text. Number one, he says to respect them. Number two, he says to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Let's pause there for a minute. Why are we called to respect and esteem the leaders here in the church? And I'm, I'm with you on this because I'm not the only leader in this church, right? right? Why are we all called to respect and esteem the leaders in the church? Is it because of their eloquence? I pray not. Is it because of their dashing good looks? Hopefully not, right? Why are we to esteem them? In love, their work. You notice that there in the text? It's because of their work. Scripture frequently points out uh, the leaders in the church are not always the most eloquent or the smartest or the most socially influential. You can think of Paul's kind of self-deferential uh, comments referring to this, like I'm not, you know, I'm not anything when I come in person. God gifts each differently. But the point here is that we respect the work with which they're tasked. 
I have a deep and abiding respect for those who lead in this church. Why? Because I know what they've been uh, uh, tasked with from God. I know the responsibility that's been laid on their shoulders. In that vein, I, I can't help but, but reference John Knox, who was a fiery Scottish reformer. John Knox said, I have never once feared the devil, but I tremble every time I enter a pulpit. That's the task of the spiritual oversight within God's church. It's a, it's a very big deal. But this portion fittingly concludes then. He says, be at peace among yourselves. Where, where, where is this leading to, this respect, this honor toward those who lead? Be at peace among yourselves. And it's commanded here for a very good reason, and we recognize this in Scripture. Why is it probably commanded? Probably because churches frequently and always struggle with being at peace among ourselves. Yeah. I can't help but as I was making my notes for this, I, sometimes these old country preacher uh, illustrations pop into my head. And I don't know if you've ever heard the one with the, the man on the island with the three huts. Let me bless you this morning from the south. <laughs> it's the, the you know, cruise ship comes across the man and he's out there on the island and there's three huts. And they ask him, what are the three huts for? And he says, well, that one's my home. And they say, well, what's the second one? He says, well, that one's my church. And they ask him, well, what's the third one for? He's like, well, that's the church I used to go to. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's a chuckler, a knee slapper there. But, but honestly, Christian churches are prone to not being at peace. Consider these three quick passages. Romans 12, 18, Paul again, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. 2 Corinthians 13, 11, Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. James 3.18 And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. We ought be at peace with one another. And if you have your, your hand in your page there, you may be looking back to the previous passages and saying, well, wait a minute, Josh. Didn't we just talk about putting on battle armor? We did, if you've forgotten already. Paul's just walked us through putting on battle armor. So isn't this just saying we should be at peace with everyone? Does that not seem a bit conflicting? Put on your battle armor for the, Lord, for the kingdom of the Lord and yet be at peace with everyone. Let me point this out. Peace comes only through Christ. Peace in this world with anyone only truly comes through Christ. In Christ we have peace. Without Christ we have no true and no lasting peace. Uh, Jesus, in one of my favorite passages of all Scripture, John 16, He said, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. There's tribulation in the world, but what do we have if we are in Christ? We have peace. We have peace because His Spirit indwells His people. Now, what I'm not saying here, let me make my qualifiers. What I'm not saying is this doesn't mean we're at peace with false teachers on the outside. We're not at peace with errant teaching that creeps into the church because peace and unity within the church is never based on a lie. Peace is only in the truth because Christ is the truth, all right? So peace is always involved with truth, hence the admonishing here. Paul's calling you to combat the things that are false on the outside, even as he calls you to peace. Further, he's not saying make peace with false proclamations of the world. We already walked through that earlier in chapter 5. What does the world promise? Peace and security. And yet there is no peace and security. It is a lie of the world. That's not the peace he's calling you to. Let's be clear. Paul is calling you to be at peace with believers who are in covenant with one another under the head of Christ. The headship, I should say, of Christ. You have peace because you're in Christ. And because that brother and sister in the aisle next to you is in Christ. So the application here, our church should be at peace with one another and we should actively pursue that peace. It doesn't fall into our lap from, from, the, from the natural man. This is something we actively pursue in our fellowship. Man, it seemed like a good place for an amen. Well, let's get to the second point. Um, I have hardly any time left already. So let's get to the second one and I'll speak quickly. Second thing, Encourage the weak. Let's look at verses 14 and 15. Encourage the weak, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Let me pause there for a minute. First, Paul asked back in verse 12, or beseeched, if you have the KJV, right? And now his asking has gone to what? 
I urge you. It's a, it's a stronger word, isn't it? I urge you. And he gives several commands in connection with that urging. First one is, and the, it's, it's such a shame to have to run through these in such short order, but I hope you get a good, a good overview of where he's going with this. We can spend lots more time. But he says, first, admonish the idol. In other words, admonish those, if you're, if you're thinking back, we live based on our identity. And Paul here is saying, admonish those who are not living in keeping with their identity. Admonish those whose identity is not accurately driving their behavior. And it seems to be a consistent problem with the Thessalonian church particularly. Paul's going to pick back up on this in the second letter to the Thessalonians, which we'll be moving into once we conclude this one. Um, not this morning, <laughs> obviously, in the coming weeks. But it seems to be a consistent problem so much so that he has to raise it again. But we could say that being idle, it's not just a neglect of physical work. I think spiritual idleness is also involved here, and I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Paul has been building a worldview, a way of looking at all of life. You're part of a kingdom, and it's the kingdom of God. And that kingdom is expanding in this world, and it's going to inevitably lead to his glorious return as the good king of the kingdom that is growing in this world. And based on that identity, once again, we are to live lives that reflect that identity. You're a child of the king, and you serve in his kingdom. Who you are drives what you do. Idleness, then, is a rejection of that. You're rejecting and neglecting to live as the one who you are. It would be like a soldier going out on a medieval battlefield and taking a nap in between the two lines of warfare, right? Not only does it make no sense, it is deadly dangerous to us to not live as Christ has called us. So that's the first one there. Encourage or Admonish the idle. Second, encourage the faint-hearted. Do you see how often we've been instructed, just in this short letter, to encourage one another? Encourage one another. I think there's a good reason for that. We, and they, and every Christian since Christ walked this earth, we need encouragement. We need encouragement. You're not the only discouraged one during your week. And if you have not reached out to one and encouraged them, I know I'm running short on time, but brothers and sisters, encourage those in this body and not just the ones you talk to every week. Reach outside of your, your close circles. Encourage one another. I say that because the faint-hearted don't need necessarily words of harsh rebuke. This isn't one of those rebuking sin scenarios. The faint-hearted, those who are weak, they don't need to hear that, nor do they need thin platitudes. Everything's going to be okay, buddy. Buck up, right? They don't need thin platitudes. They need encouragement. But make sure it's the right kind of encouragement. What's Paul pointing to as their encouragement? Live as a child of the king. Remember who you are. This is his words of encouragement to a church that needs it. So when you encourage your brothers and sisters, what should those words of encouragement uh, sound like? Live like a child of the king and call them to the gospel. That's where we find the true encouragement. This is important. Brothers and sisters, Christians today are suffering under a plague of faint-heartedness. Shaking knees and very weak backs in the, in the face, again, of not only the challenges of our life, not only the strife that the forces of evil want to see flourish within our church, but also the normal challenges of a world that is spinning out of control seemingly. But it's not, and you serve a God who raises the dead. Encourage one another with those words. Oh, we could dwell there the rest of the time. Let's move. Help the weak. Encourage, but then also help the weak. And I would just say this. So much of Christian living is remembering that you're part of a body. Christianity is not a lone ranger sport. It is not a sticker you put on your shirt and you're a, you're a Christian alone. No, you are called to a body. And I hope you're hearing that when we're doing things within this church. It is never as a lone ranger activity. You're called to covenant with these people. And part of that covenant, part of the beauty of that covenant is some days when my shoulder is aching really badly, I'm relying on the other shoulder that's working better. All the older guys in this congregation are immediately engaged in this conversation, right? You know where I'm at. We are given one another with so many varying gifts and strengths within this congregation. Why? Because I need you and you are probably going to need me. We need one another and God equips the body with what it needs. In that regard, help the weak among us. He concludes with some fitting words, be patient. Oh, be patient with them all. And this is one I think we can all say we struggle with. Patience is an attitude of dealing with slow growth. 
Parenting is a lot like this. I want them to be ahead of this obstacle. I want them to have outgrown this stage. I want them to understand these things. What's patience? Dealing with the slow growth patiently, encouragingly. It means not holding a grudge. It means not muttering irritation under our breath. It means loving one another and doing all those things we just said despite the challenges of our current sanctification. Despite the fact that they wronged you, encourage them. Despite the fact that you have every reason to hold a grudge, encourage the weak. Help them, pray for them, and admonish them. And I point that out again because so many of these things flow from our identity. If we show impatience, Our impatience is showing impatience with the plan of the sovereign God. Do you get how that works? You're not just being impatient with the person. You're being impatient with the God who said he will finish the good work in them, just as he is finishing the good work in all of us. Now, what may surprise, these instructions of encouraging and helping, these aren't given to elder candidates. These aren't given to deacons in training, if that was such a, such a position. I quite like the sound of that. <laughs> Who are these instructions given to? He's given to the church body. This is all of our call. All of us are called to this. There's a vital and there's an indispensable role that the church member plays. You are called to encourage and help those that are within this congregation. Let me point out, you're needed for this. The leaders of any given church can't do this alone. This is the call of every member of the congregation. If you ever feel like you're not needed or don't have a role here because you don't serve in some specific capacity, let me encourage you, read this passage. Say, how can I live this out? we got to move quick. We're going to go just a little bit over, but I know you'll forgive me because we're talking about forgiveness. (laughs) You have to. Um, He said, we also do not repay evil for evil. And that might be the most countercultural part of this whole passage to me. In, In the midst of all of this, Christian... You do not repay evil for evil. Now, that doesn't mean, despite how some people have read this, this doesn't mean you're called to be a doormat or a complete pacifist as a Christian. Well, I better just, you know, let everybody walk all over me. It's not saying you don't defend your home if someone was to invade and try to do harm to your family. In fact, I'd say you're kind of, kind of commanded to do so. This is talking about repaying evil for evil, dishing back out evil in return for the evil. In other words, when someone wrongs me, I do not seek to wrong them in return. And you know we can talk our ways around this. Oh, I'm really trying to help them. But no, no, you know what's in your heart, right? And I do too. We do not wrong one another in return for a wrong that has come against me. When someone offends me, I don't offend them back, nor do I hold that within myself, nor do I have building contempt with, within myself and uh, have a distance between that. Per- Brothers and sisters, this is how fishers start within the covenant body of Christ. I don't repay you evil for evil. I exercise all these gifts of forgiveness that God said he supplies to me and for our good. Christians are people of justice, but when we repay evil for evil, we're being people of vigilantism. That's not justice because God said he is the good judge. He's the righteous judge who will certainly adjudicate all things. Within this body, it's not my place to dish evil upon someone else. God forbid. Instead, encourage, build up, love, If you're you're thinking through this, this should be building a pretty immense view of the church. Church is not just a social club you come to. There's something far bigger, and I think that's for a reason. Paul just talked about looking to the day of the Lord coming and all the forces of evil swirling against the king who will make all things right. And in the context of that, here's how you live as a church. This is a big, big view. The reason for that should be clear. Christ said... And I tell you in Matthew 16, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build whose church? My church, Christ said. It's his church. And he said he'll build it. And then he continues, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In other words, nothing will stop its offensive movement forward. Nothing will stop Christ's church. And then he continues in Ephesians 5, or Paul does rather, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he tells us that Christ loved the church, gave himself for her. Christ loved the church. On the cross in the mind of Christ, he is purchasing a people unto himself. And here, he's instructing us how to unite as that people that he has bought with his blood. The takeaway here, if you love Christ, you'll love his church. If you love Christ, you will love his church. And because Christ is building his church, his church will be triumphant. Third thing this morning, and I'll talk really, really fast. I can't end it right here. Forgive me later. This one's very short. Rejoice always. What does this lead you to? 
Rejoice always. Verse 16, and again, we could spend a month on this passage. 16, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So the previous section, it dealt with our relationship with one another. It talks about leaders within the church. It talks about fellow believers within the church. So I'm wondering then, are these commands inwardly focused? Because that's typically how we read them, right? Like rejoice, pray without ceasing. We're thinking, oh, these are inward activities, right? I tuck these away in, in my heart. I would say on the one hand, we could apply these personally. Christian, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God for you. And that's good. That should lead you to a life of constant rejoicing, prayer, thanksgiving. You should be singing in your heart when I can't hear you, right? Like this is what we're called to as Christians. And indeed, he says, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. But... I think this is intimately connected with what came before. Paul's still thinking here and speaking here of the church body. In other words, you're to do these things in community with one another. Church, plural. Let me use my, my Southern. Y'all. <laughs> Y'all pray without ceasing. Y'all rejoice constantly. This is distracting from the power of this passage, isn't it? The y'alls. <laughs> Guys, this is how we live as a church together. We sing together, we pray together, we worship together, we cry together, we weep together, we encourage one another together. We do this as a body because that is what Christ has purchased. We're quite quite prone. I've pointed this out already. I won't delay this. We're quite quite prone to individualism. And there's certainly individual instructions, but I want to encourage you. The life of a Christian is one that you are called to live in community with one another. And that, that bears out from the flow of this letter. Why are you called to encourage one another with these words? Because the expectation is you're doing this in, com- in, co- uh, in covenant with your church family. You're together with them. Encourage one another with these words. And the best thing about these, and this is the best thing about them, not the dreary part, they're commands. Every one of those is a command. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. Commands from Almighty God to you, Christian and to us as a gathered body. Why is that so uplifting? Because if God commands it, he supplies the means to do it. If God calls you to do something, you can rest assured he has given you the ability. Ah, I can't pray all the time. I can't rejoice in the circumstances. Brothers and sisters, pray, give thanks, rejoice. This is the will of God for you, and he supplies what is needed. Uh, Augustine, one of the the great theologians of the... the, uh, well, I guess 5th century, but Augustine said this. He said, speaking to God, give what you command and command what you will. Give what you command and command what you will. In other words, God gives us the ability to do this. So in closing, and we will wrap up here, and, and my thanks to you for sticking with me on this, but in closing, how do we as the church give thanks in all circumstances? Ah, it's a challenging part, isn't it? How do we give thanks as a church in all circumstances with that week you've had, with the year you're having maybe, with the television that you turned on this week and were horrified at the state of like whatever that looks like, how do we give thanks in all circumstances? I would say this, we remember that we are children of the King. We are children of the King, and the King has called us to serve in His glorious and unstoppable and eternal kingdom. We're called to be about kingdom business, brothers and sisters, and kingdom business is joyful business. Kingdom business is joyful business. And why do I say that? Because Paul sang before he was in the jail cell. It's my favorite story in that regard. Acts 16, read it later. But Paul starts singing in the jail cell. Why? Because he was singing before he was in the jail cell. Kingdom business is joyful, hopeful, encouraging business. And we can remember that and get a little bit of grasp when we remember we are about something that is much bigger than those troubles that I brought up at the front end. And that's not to dismiss them. It's serious. The effects of sin and devil and world in this world, there is serious things you are dealing with. But you're about something far bigger than this. And this is why we're trying to do small things like the adoption fund, the adoption foster fund that we set up here at this church, looking toward how to pour into the next generation and the next generation after that. We're trying to have a long view of a very big kingdom that God is building. The darkness doesn't scare me and it shouldn't scare you and it can't scare you because why? There's a king and he said he will build his kingdom. 
So how do we give thanks then in the midst of a crumbling culture? And it is. But how do we give thanks in the middle of a crumbling culture? How do we give thanks in the midst of a jail cell like Paul found himself? How do we give thanks in all of those circumstances? I would encourage you with this. We form a very long view of a very big kingdom And we recognize that even if God justly brings disaster on our city, so to speak, and I mean every word of that, if he brings just disaster upon our city, we praise him, we labor hard, and we celebrate what God will bring from the rubble. We have a long view of a very big kingdom. Why? Because our call as Christians, again, remember the metaphor of the soldier, our call is to sing loudly right from the midst of the battlefield. You don't sing on your way home. You sing in the midst of the fight. Why? There's a good king, and you're called to his kingdom, and his kingdom will have no end. Brothers and sisters, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let's pray. Lord God, we are so grateful and we thank you and we praise you that you reign over all, God. We're comforted by the fact that there is a king, a king who has called all things into existence, a king who has made all things to glorify him, a king who is in charge of everything that happens in our lives. Not a thing slips between the king's fingers. God, you're a good king and you've called us to be part of your kingdom Lord, it gives us an identity, it gives us a task, and it gives us hope. Lord, I know there's many things that are impacting the families of this church, Lord. There is many out of the ordinary things, but Lord, there's just the normal struggles of everyday life. My sin that seems to hang on at my heel, the challenges of death in this world, and sickness, and pain, and hurt. Lord, the, the sight of a culture, Lord, that has rejected you and seems to be spiraling in so many ways. God, in the midst of that, let us encourage one another with these words, God. There is something far greater, far more lasting, and far more eternal that you are building right here in our midst, God. Let us be motivated with that, God. I'm given a short time on this world. Lord, let us serve you with every breath and every day and every ounce of our strength that you may be glorified in this world and in the world to come. God, we ask all these things in the name of Christ. Amen.